Good evening, everybody. My name is John Anastasio, and I am a third degree high priest of the Karelian nativist tradition. Uh, I'm also the shrine keeper at uh, the Shrine of the Western Waters here in Seattle, Washington, which is a relatively new endeavor. And um, I'm hoping that uh, we have plenty of time for, we have, well, we do have plenty of time for your questions tonight, and uh, I hope I can be of service to you uh, in helping you think about things and, and answering whatever questions you may come up with. And so uh, the, let's see, I'll give you a little bit about my background since I don't see any questions popping at this point. And um, yeah, so I've been a member of the tradition for since about 2008 and I have been a high priest for about three years. And until I started the uh, until I, howdy, hi there, Linda. Until I started the uh, the shrine about three months ago, um, which is I was going to say it's up and running. It's really kind of more up and jogging. Uh, we've done a few things. Uh, there are a few interested people, but um, you know it's really at the very beginning stages. And uh, so I practiced solitary for a long time, and um, my studies at which school uh, were, you know, were all online. And and it was about three or four years ago I. Um, I, went, I started connecting with people in person, which I found uh, a lot more, you know, I found really interesting and, and really cemented my connection to the tradition. And um, so the purpose of the shrine is really around three things, and it really sort of focuses on the kinds of things that I've been doing. I'm a Reiki master teacher, and the shrine is really focused on uh, healing and also on ritual and devotion. So the things we've done so far are things like lunar rituals and um, an invulk ceremony, invulk ritual. And um, the other focus is on learning and growth. And you may be aware, because you've probably seen a bunch of posts go by about the radio show that I do every Tuesday afternoon at six o'clock or Tuesday evening at six o'clock Pacific time. I am based in Seattle. And um, the uh, the radio show is called Reclaiming Your Sacred Path, and it's about that whole focus of learning and growth, of really sort of coming into your own purpose and your own sense of who you are as a spiritual being. And so the um, you know that's really kind of what I've been up to. And so if there are any questions that you have that you'd like me to respond to, please you know just go ahead and comment. Um, the hi, hey Jeremy, how are you? Good to see you too. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about the show and also about the work on um, something called The Green Door, which is, uh, you know, a study section on, um, you know, that we have in, in, on, the, uh, on the Facebook network of the, hey, hey, Liz, how are you, of the tradition. And um, the, the show is really the focus of that, of that study group. Um, and the reason, uh, basically what I've been doing, so last night, uh, I guess today's Wednesday, so yesterday, uh, the guest on the show was Lady Stephanie Neal, and we had a great conversation about the kinds of study groups and orders that you can become involved in, uh, in the tradition, and, and the book that she has written, The Untraining of a Sea Priestess, and that was a good conversation. So it's basically an hour-long show on subjects, as I like to say, uh, related to growth in the human spirit. And... Every week I'm interviewing somebody who's got a path to talk about, you know, who's got their own path that they chose to uh, follow or that they were compelled to follow to the spiritual path that they're on today. And, um, you know, so that might be that might be a place to start as well, because I can talk about uh, I can talk about my path and how I came to the Corellian tradition. Uh, but I don't want to make it all about me. I want to talk about you as well. So the. You know, the real purpose of reclaiming your sacred path is about for people who either have um, lost their way on their own spiritual path or in some way have um, felt disconnected from spirit or have a longing for spirit. And so they have, um, you know, but they don't quite know where to turn. And, you know, the, I always think about, yeah, I do every, every Wednesday. So today I was at a metaphysical store here in Bellevue, Washington, offering Reiki healing. And uh, hello, Pam. How are you? Hi, Ed. Hi, everybody. What night is my show? My show is Tuesday, uh, every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific, which is 9 p.m. Eastern time. And it's called Reclaiming Your Sacred Path. It's on a, uh, 
network called BBM or Bold Brave Media, BBM Global Network. And, um, you know, it's about an hour long. It is an hour long. And uh, every week I have a guest. Um, and it's been an interesting ride because it's I've heard a lot of interesting stories about people's sacred paths, about their path to finding the, uh, the you know, the pathway that works for them. And that is really the purpose of the work. Hey, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. And um, so, yeah, well, let me talk about let me talk about finding paths for a minute, because the generally what um, I don't know if you've seen, maybe you've seen it. If you've if you're on this Facebook page, you probably have seen the meme that's going around of Wiley Coyote suddenly realizing that he has run off the cliff and he's got that look on his face that he's like, holy cow, what just happened or what is about to happen. And that is a moment that generally sends people looking for an answer uh, that their feet are not now going to be able to provide. And so whether it's, you know, something humorous like that, where you suddenly run into a situation where, uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to find an answer or more, you know, more commonly, hi, Katiana, more commonly the, um, the impetus for someone needing to get on a pathway or find their pathway is that they, um, there's some life changing event. There's some, for some, it's really kind of a dark night of the soul where they suddenly realize that the path that they've been following uh, doesn't work for them anymore. And, you know, being able to make sense out of all of it once you start looking for it. Um, so, for example, you know, I was talking about the metaphysical store. People will walk into that store and they'll be looking for an answer. You know, they'll be they'll be in some kind of turmoil, there'll be some kind of emotional issue, some kind of dilemma that they're trying to solve. And they're looking for a book or a crystal or a card deck or something or a reading that's going to help them. And they're saying, you know, people will say, I know I, you know, I came in here. I know the answer's in here somewhere. And they're right because they brought it in with them because the answer is here. And it's being able to get in touch with that part of ourselves that really does have that wisdom, that really what all the training that we go through in which school is all about. And so, you know, in my own case, it was about 2008 when the wheels came off for me. And I had been studying, really, I'd been on a, a spiritual path, really, most of my life. And, you know, I was always oriented to crystals and stones and always... Um, Looking at uh, looking at tarot cards and, and studying studying different disciplines. I studied shamanism uh, through the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. I worked my way through a course in miracles. I um, I did all of these things while I was also pursuing a, a very consuming career. And hi everybody. Hey Miranda. Hey Jennifer. How's everybody doing? Anybody got a question? Anyway, I'll keep going. So. Um, what happened was, you know, around 2008, when the economy went sideways, you probably remember that, you know, things, a lot of things changed for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I was still fairly close to my last Saturn return when that happened. And by the way, I hope you're all being able to keep your balance in the retrograde. But the, um, you know, I found myself really at a crossroads and I reached for that spiritual, I reached for that spiritual path that, I had thought I had been following and I discovered it wasn't there. And the reason it wasn't there was because I really hadn't been practicing anything with discipline. I had been doing a, a lot of things a little bit and whether it was transcendental meditation or whatever it was. And so the, uh, what's that Liz? What's the most functioning? Is that a question? All right. Well, we'll wait for that. Ah, what's the most fulfilling thing for me about my work in helping other folks? Well, you know, I think that, um, so there was an example today when I was, uh, I was at uh, the metaphysical shop at Stargazers where I do the work and I, we got a phone call uh, that a woman who had uh, seen me at a psychic fair there about six months ago um, wanted to do a distance healing session. And so she really, you know, when, usually when you get a phone call for something like that, um, it isn't something that you can schedule two weeks out. And so probably the most gratifying thing there was being able to really help her clarify what it was that was going on for her and be able to do distance healing in a way that really provided the energetic support that she needed to make some important decisions. And 
that really gets me to what is truly the most gratifying thing, which is being able to energetically and cognitively really help people figure out that they really do have the ability to find their own answers and find their own path. And, you know, because I talk about in on the show and in the book that, you know, when, when I was studying uh, shamanism with the foundation, one of the things that uh, came through loud and clear is the reason that they were teaching um, the reason that they were teaching shamanism to the public was because they wanted to provide people with a real understanding of their own spiritual autonomy. And what that really means is that you really do have the ability and the responsibility to create your own relationship with spirit. We all do. And we have to manage that ourselves. And, you know, one of the things that excuse me, one of the things that, that really resonated for me with the tradition was a couple of things. One is obviously the, um, one is the fact that we are really, we accept all paths, right? And so the, the pathways, the spiritual pathways that can lead you to the tradition are many and varied. And we looking at paganism and the pagan community as a whole with just different facets and different ways of doing things that are equally valid and equally meaningful um, within, of course, the confines of the one, the one rule, the read, which is do as you will, but harm none. And the, that the inclusiveness of it was a big chunk of what led me here. But the most fulfilling thing for me is being able to help people recognize that spiritual autonomy and reclaim it for themselves. So does that do it, Liz? How's that? And Annette, hi. You said you had a question after I'm done with Liz. So what's up? Hi, Lori B. Go ahead, Annette. <laughs> Thanks, Liz. After I answer Liz, continue on with how I was dealing with Okay. As a healer, my, well, as soon as you can get back to that, I think I know where you're going, but I don't want to assume. Uh, so Miranda wants to know, as a healer myself, do I perform my own healings or do I have another healing, healer work on me? You know, it's interesting. Um, just about anybody, I, those of you who are Reiki practitioners who are, who are listening, who are on, you can comment on this. But what I find is that self-Reiki is, is much more subtle and is not as uh, powerful an experience as having another Reiki practitioner work on me. And in fact, one of the things that I find myself doing with, I know, you know, some people who come to me for Reiki are Reiki practitioners. And um, often it'll be when I've, I've been somewhere talking to them or, you know, been at a Reiki circle or a psychic fair or something, and they start talking about how they're feeling depleted. And well, yeah, I mean, anything you do, if you do it uh, without getting your own energy replenished is going to deplete your energy. And it's not that you're giving away your energy through Reiki. We know that can't happen. But getting Reiki, getting a healing from another practitioner does two things. It makes you look at things differently because they see things, they see things that you might not see. Um, you know how hard it is with doing your shadow work to really see some of the things that you have to confront and, and do it clearly and well. And I think it's the same thing with, with healing. I always go to other people for healing, um, but and I won't necessarily go to Reiki people for healing. I, there's a there's a woman who's a master herbalist who does um, flower essences that um, I found extremely helpful. And so, you know, it's um, when I feel the need when I can't figure it out, I know that I need to go and get help from someone else. Same thing with readings. Uh, sometimes I can do readings for myself, and sometimes I know I'm fooling myself. Does that make sense? Okay, I, and it says, I said I was dealing with challenges. You mean back in 2008, back then? Hi, Sandra. Yeah, if that's what you're talking about, um, you know, the, the challenges were involving really looking at, um, I guess the best way to sum it up is when, you know, I talk about this a lot on the show and, and with people that we have, from the time we're very young, we are taught how to be. Right. We're taught the things that we need to do in order to uh, be good what citizens, family members, uh, you know, 
good good members of our church uh, and we're taught what we need to do in order and if we do those things the promise is that we will have the good things in life and you know if you want to know what the good things in life are to, according to the dominant uh, culture you just have to watch the Super Bowl ads right and so the um, you know but so if we if we just do the things that we're supposed to do by that definition we will have those things and then we will be fulfilled or be happy. And it's very often when you've been running that routine for a while and uh, you get to the place where um, it isn't working anymore, you realize you're living somebody else's life. And that's very often the thing that sends people in search of their spiritual path. And Stephanie um, wants to know, when I tell people, uh, when people tell me witchcraft is not a real thing or has no significant place in society anymore, how do you respond to that? <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because the thing when when I I rarely walk around just sort of thinking of myself as a witch, although I realize that that's exactly what I'm doing. Um, it's the same thing as I don't call myself a shaman, uh, but I do shamanic healing. And the when when people challenge that, and I have been challenged by some people very close to me. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to point out that, uh, in particular, one of those people is pretty much somebody I would consider a master manifester. Uh, and they are able to focus and direct energy toward an intention better than anybody I know. And isn't that what we're doing? Um, you know, I think the difference is, of course, uh, the Wiccan beliefs uh, associated with witchcraft. Well, we know that every Wiccan is not a witch and every witch is not a Wiccan. But, um, you know, to me, for me, a witch is uh, someone who adheres to the reed, who is able to connect with spirit in their own autonomous way, has a, has a method of gathering data f information from spirit, not data, but information from spirit and guidance, and is able to focus and direct energy toward an intention that is uh, hopefully for the good of all with harm toward none. And so I explain that. And when they say it, it's not a real thing, I ask them if they want to hear stories or, if, you know, because the thing I don't want to get into is like, it's like skeet shooting, right? If somebody sends up a clay pigeon or, you know, you send up, you send up a target, they shoot it down. And so I'm not going to get into a debate about it, but basically um, often what I'll do is I'll look at them and say, well, if, if you were to imagine what you would need to hear from me to believe that witchcraft is a thing, what would it have to be? What would I have to tell you in order for you to believe it? What what would you need? And see what they say. So that's pretty much my approach to it. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that I think we need to conduct those conversations in a way that's respectful of their beliefs. And even if they're really challenging with us, we don't have to accept abuse, certainly. But, um, you know, to be able to leave that conversation saying, well, you know, this is how I know it. This is this is how I see it. And, uh, you know, we're free to disagree. Uh, but, you know, I, I would invite them also to experience it, to experience a ritual, for example, where we're doing an act of power. And, you know, if you get somebody to do that, if they will come, then pretty it's not it's not a very big stretch to help have them see that there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of the order of activities uh, in a ritual at a church service. And particularly when people are on the sides of the church lighting candles to saints and asking for intercession. Um, so anyway, I think you get it. So let's see. Um, Miranda, so uh, we did that okay? We handled that? Okay. So Elizabeth says, my husband is sick, not sure how much time he has. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm very sorry to hear that. That's very difficult. I want to be able to talk him through his anger. I want help. I want to help calm him. And so I'm going to make you the offer that if you wanted to talk about this, you could uh, send me an email at john, J-O-N, at powerandhealing.com. But I will also, uh, because I don't, I don't know how deep you want to go here tonight, but I will say that um, the, probably the biggest key in helping someone through their anger is listening, because the root of anger is hurt and fear in this case, I think probably. And so really being able to listen and and listen and allow that anger to come out and to be empathic and to to listen to it and until it until it sort of winds down its energy and you can get to the hurt below it. 
um, because that's usually what the root of it is. And I, that's a really simplistic answer maybe right now, but um, I hope that's helpful. Uh, Annette says, I have been a solitary practitioner for years and now I have a coven family. We are in all parts of the country and meet once a year. That's pretty cool. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and, you, and it says, no need for acceptance from others as long as you're strong in your love and light. Then I assume, I assume that's about what if somebody thinks witchcraft is uh, not a thing, right? And uh, I think that's a really good point, Annette. Thank you. So what would be the best way to explain my Wiccan views to my very Christian boyfriend? Wow. Um, so probably the... Um, I'm just I'm thinking through what my approach has been with uh, a couple of people that I've had that I've had that situation with. And I guess I don't see it as being solvable in one conversation. But what again, I think it is I think that something that's very important related to it is to listen for what it is that is really behind the objection, because a lot of times it's it's fear. A lot of times it's a belief that Wicca is and witchcraft are dark. Um, and you know the popular the popular definitions of it and the popular explanations of it certainly don't help us, right? And and particularly when um, you know when the, they you know what will be sensationalized as soon as something goes wrong, but uh, you know when everything everything that's going right never gets reported, right? So I think the thing about it is to again listen for what it is that they're afraid of. If you know if they believe that it's dark, um, I think that. Um, Probably the the thing that has worked for me is to really just kind of stop the conversation, particularly if it's starting to get ahead, get up ahead of steam, and say, "Wait, let's just let's just hold on for a minute," because I can explain to you, I can tell you exactly in what ways it's not dark, and exactly in what ways it is not dangerous, and why you don't have to be afraid of it. And you know, very often the fear is not so much about. It, it probably is about the popular notions of Wicca and witchcraft, but it's also a lot of people have a fear of spirit. I mean, there are a lot of people whose beliefs are based on the fact that they have to be protected in some way from a vengeful, wrathful God. And of course, we believe quite the opposite. And so getting someone to understand that God no, not only isn't angry with you, or goddess and God are not angry. Well, they're, they're, first of all, there is goddess and God, and they're not only not angry with you, they want you to grow and thrive, and they want you to be well. Um, I think the, the best thing is, again, listening and really getting clear about, let me know when you're ready to really listen to what I have to say to you. I hope that helps. And uh, Let's see, Lori B., can I explain what reclaiming your sacred path is, what it means, or how it is done? Sure. Okay. So reclaiming your sacred path is, um, it's a process and it's a book and it's, as I've said, a radio show and you can get the book through the core store of the tradition. Um, and let me pick up on that in a minute, Lori. I've got a question about healing here. Samantha, would you suggest Reiki healing to someone who has a hard time focusing their thoughts and energy into one place or image? I have a very active mind, but not ADHD. However, I also have high anxiety and pent up my energy. Yeah, Samantha, I think um, particularly with anxiety and high energy and, and that kind of thing, Reiki can be a very helpful thing It can because it really is, at, at, its, at least, it creates relief of stress and anxiety when you get a Reiki treatment. And, you know, the, the other part of it is that mindfulness work, doing mindfulness meditation. Um, and I know the last thing when you're feeling that stressed out and j that jangly, the last thing you feel like you can do is sit still. And so it may be that getting a Reiki treatment or, pr or learning Reiki and being able to do it on yourself would be helpful because if you're doing Reiki on yourself, you feel like you're doing something, even though you're still relaxing with your hands on yourself. Um, and you're, you're meditating uh, while you're doing it and you're focusing. But uh, so that might be very helpful. So back to reclaiming your sacred path. Reclaiming your sacred path means, so first of all, reclaiming means that you're getting back something that you had, but maybe you lost. And that gets back to the story I was telling earlier. Um, 
we all came here. We know that from our from all the work that we've done, all the studying that we've done, that we all we each of us came here with a, with a purpose. We had a reason for coming here. We had a set of lessons we wanted to learn, and all of the things that we have experienced and all of the things we're going to experience are opportunities to learn those lessons. Now, I don't want to confuse that with the you create your own reality, so everything that bad that happens to you is your fault kind of philosophy, because I don't believe that. But I do believe that we are confronted in life with situations, and the ways that we learn to deal with those situations productively are the lessons that we are here to learn. And we probably run into the things we intended to run into, but that's another issue. That's not the same thing, I mean. So reclaiming your sacred path is, first of all, remembering that you are a spiritual being having a material existence, that you came here for the growth and evolution of your immortal soul, and that you have a purpose that is your purpose. And that gets that's why this next word is yours, your. Sacred means it's really, really critically important. It is the most important thing we have to do is to really get back in touch with that purpose and and figure out what is what is the vision that we want to create, create our own vision for our life path that will lead us to fulfill that purpose until the day that we take our last step. And maybe we get all the way there, maybe we don't, and we pick it up next time. But that's not even the point. The point is that we really get back in touch with who and what we really are. We create our own path to the fulfillment of that purpose. And that that pathway, you know, uh, Carlos Castaneda said something that I really love about um, that, that if you, that essentially all paths lead to the same place. And so it's important to choose a path with heart. And you know a path has heart for you if it feels fulfilling, if it feels engaging, if you feel like it's bringing you in touch with your inner being and with deity and with, you know, the, the realms of spirit as you understand them. And so that's what it is. The process is, first of all, creating that vision for what do you want your path to look like? And, and when you signed up for... When you signed on for Wicca and witchcraft, you had a vision in your mind. And maybe it evolved. Maybe you had a feeling and you followed that feeling. But at some point, it's, you know, from that, I, I started, I talked about that we, we very often are told to do certain things and then we'll have the good things and then we'll be fulfilled. But it's actually the reverse. First, we have to figure out and determine and define and come back into touch with who we are and what we are and be that and be that authentic spiritual being having a material existence. And then we will naturally do the things that resonate for us. You know, we will do the things that have integrity for us. And, you know, if you if you believe in the read, if you sign on for do as you will, but harm none, then if you, that is in the core of your being, then you will behave that way and you will do that. And then you will have naturally the things that flow from that which will probably be the things that you would truly find fulfilling and so that's really the process it's creating that vision for what do i want my life to be like look like feel like what do i want it, what do i want this path to be like for me and what are my core values what are the things are that are really non-negotiable for me and that i will yeah i will go to the wall for that i stand for the things that that i will be known for believing in and standing for in my life and then we got to take a look at the gap between the two, um, you know, and say, that's my vision and those are my values and how am I doing, you know, and that is a, that is a self assessment. You know, nobody can do it for you. And you can ask for feedback certainly, but, but ultimately it's your self assessment. And then it's a process of working through our shadow and figuring out what is in my way. What are the things that are preventing me or blocking me from fully realizing that path? And then taking those thoughts and using a cycle of divination to gain guidance from spirit, your own guidance from spirit, because remember, you're an autonomous spiritual being, your own guidance from spirit about what would be my next best step for this thing that I'm thinking about. Then creating an intention and doing all the things you magically know how to do to support the manifestation of that intention. And of course, we know we have to, we have to actually do the work of, of acting on it. And then the third leg of the stool is healing, which is we're going to find stuff, uh, you know, inside that we really have to work through things that are unresolved, the shadow work that we talk about that Lord Don talks about on vlogs and, and in all of the writings uh, that we have, all of the books that we have. And 
doing that shadow work, soul retrieval, whatever means we have to do it, is critically important because that's what's peeling the onion. That's what's peeling away all of the things that block us from really standing in our integrity and in our authenticity. And doing that work requires healing, both for the trauma that we may have behind us itself and also for the stress of walking that path. It takes effort to do these things, right? We can't just light a candle, well, sometimes, I won't say we can't, but very often lighting the candle is not sufficient. We have to light the candle and then we have to get on our feet and we have to get going and we have to do something to manifest the thing that we have decided that we want to manifest in our lives. So that's reclaiming your sacred path and the ending, so the book takes you to an action plan. It takes you to an action plan of what are you going to do in terms of what is the next step for you? What's your next mission, if you will? And then what are the, you know, getting clear about the values that drive you and what are you going to do differently or next in terms of divination, in terms of manifestation and in terms of healing to build that cycle of growth for yourself? You know, because the other thing about healing is it, it's about building resilience. It's about being able to, to really recover, rest, reflect. You know, one aspect of healing is solving the, you know, it's not just about taking away your headache with Reiki. It's really about removing the blocks to your becoming your true self. And so using energy healing replenishes your energy. Um, any, any form of healing it could be just going out in nature, right? It could be acupuncture. It could be yoga, it could be whatever it is that helps you build your resilience. Because every time you go through that cycle of divination, manifestation and working to make something happen and then recovery reflection and healing every time you do that you get stronger and you build capacity and so that's the whole story about reclaiming your sacred path so there you go so what else what else do we have do i have any book recommendations and samantha you are welcome i hope it's helpful um stephanie wants to know do i have any book recommendations on the history of witchcraft uh you have one called the oxford Illustrated history on witchcraft and magic. Um, and you'd like to expand your knowledge. You know, I'm going to invite anybody who's online who has books on the history of witchcraft uh, to go ahead and jump in. One of the things about uh, my particular personality, um, I'm so I am an empath. I'm also uh, an intuitive. And I am the thing that if you if you were to look at my sort of psychological profile, the things that you would find, the thing that you would find last on my list is detail orientation and uh, depth of, of detailed knowledge. Um, and it's not my instinct to read books on the history of witchcraft, um, although I certainly have read them. Um, but my real thing is, how does it work? That's that's my deal. I, I, I just really want to make it work. Um, you know, I, I often connect with the history of witchcraft by, um, by being in Salem, for example, and, and connecting that way and having experiences of it. And so that's, it's kind of not my thing, but I would invite anybody, uh, I assume you all can see the comments here. So anybody who's got a book that would be useful for Stephanie, please, by all means. Uh, actually, I probably got most of my knowledge of the history of witchcraft from Lord Don from the degree programs, to tell you the truth. So what else you got? What other questions? Oh no, dead air. If this was radio, that would be real trouble. So let's see, what else can we talk about? So in terms of, in terms of what, let's see. So somebody asked me before what, what I felt that the, um, what was really fulfilling for me in doing the healing work. Um, there's actually a couple of answers to that too. You know, I first started studying energy healing in 1981 in, uh, when I learned therapeutic touch and uh, I was working at a hospital, we were starting a hospice program and we brought it in to uh, teach the uh, clinicians to use it so that they could work with their patients with it. And fast forward to about five years ago, I started volunteering um, as a Reiki volunteer at the hospice here in King County in Washington. And um, so I would go visit patients in the field and also at the hospice center and I ran a Reiki circle for volunteers for a while, um, you know, to basically as a support for the volunteers who were um, 
who were looking for, uh, you know, who basically who had been working with patients all week and they needed or all month. It was a monthly circle and wanted replenishment and connection. And so working with hospice patients uh, and, you know, doing doing Reiki for people in the last stages of life was incredibly profoundly uh, fulfilling for me. Um, and it it was actually kind of astonishing how, you know, a lot of times what will happen is, you know, like we were talking about, what do you, what do, you do when people um, uh, sort of diss witchcraft? And um, most people, you know, the, the hospice folks will offer Reiki to the family, offer a comfort touch, really, uh, massage, uh, therapeutic touch, Reiki, uh, reflexology. And, you know, the family, most people have heard of reflexology, certainly massage and, you know, Reiki, they're kind of like, yeah, whatever, you know, if it'll be helpful, go ahead. And the connection with the patient, once you start doing it, is just astounding. Um, and I had two experiences of working with people for a year before they passed, and it was um, incredibly profound work. And so that was, that was tremendously fulfilling. But, you know, for me, anytime I can help someone feel more in command of their life, and help them from a healing perspective, from an energetic perspective, feel like they are more aligned and more centered and that they can now go on with something that they were having trouble dealing with. Um, I just love it. You know, that's, that's kind of why I do what I do. So any other questions? Thank you for the emojis. I appreciate them. So let's see. I don't know. I think, you know, are we are we kind of done? Anybody have another question? Well, I'll tell you, we've been at this for a little over a half hour. I think, um, you know, I'm happy to have shared this time with you and I'm happy to be uh, a resource for you. I gave you my email earlier. Uh, J -O John, J-O-N, at powerandhealing.com. I'd be happy to talk more about any of the things we discussed, but um, thank you for being here, and I hope that you all have a very, very wonderful night, and blessed be. <laughs>